Good morning, everybody. My name is Samantha Mirabal with Melco's application team, and we are doing our design shop talk today to see what questions you might have to get them answered. We're live on both Facebook and YouTube, so if you see me looking off to the side, I've got a second monitor set up where I can try to keep track of the questions that are coming in to try to you know, get them answered real time while we're live. If you do have questions, please type them in in the comments. Don't send them privately. Um, I don't see those um, until long after the fact. So just type them in in the comments on both either Facebook or YouTube, and I will try to keep track of them periodically as we're going. All right, so I will start off with the questions that um, were sent in ahead of time, and we'll kind of jump from there. Let's see what we can get covered today. All right, so how to make lettering bolder. There's also another question that says, what is pull comp that we have? So those are actually both related. So we'll, let's look at those sorts of things. All right, so first off, if we understand what pull comp is, when I bring up the lettering, it might make a little more sense. So I'm going to take this guy. All right, so I've got a rectangle on my screen and Pull compensation is basically you're going to digitize in a little bit of extra boldness, uh, overstitching, however you want to think about it, so that when you sew, embroidery shrinks, right? So as it, it's going to shrink a little bit, which is normal. You minimize that with good hooping, good stabilizers, but in the end, it's still going to shrink a little bit. So we want to compensate for that, and that's what pull compensation is. It's compensating for that pull that happens while it's sewing, all right? So if I just look at this guy and I go into the properties, go into compensation. Now, if I do pull compensation by percentage, that's multiplication based, right? So if I say 120% pull comp, you'll notice my rectangle no longer looks like a rectangle, right? So even though I drew in a rectangle, what's it saying? Well, it's multiplication based. It's looking at the length from one side to the other. And this dotted line that you see here is my stitch direction. Okay. So it's saying, all right, overstitch my box by 20%. All right. So here it's longer Then if I look over here, it's really short. So overstitch it, you know, 20% of a small number is a small number. 20% of a big number is a big number. All right. So it's going to overstitch that and make it a little bit bolder, hopefully to compensate it. Now that's using percentage. I'll say, quite frankly, I don't use pull by percent ever because I don't like that distortion. I like point based. So if I go into pull compensation and I say, okay, I'm gonna make this a number you shouldn't use just so we can see it. All right, so if I say 10 points, all right, notice if I zoom in on this, it's over stitching off of my wireframe. Okay, it's making it larger to allow for when it shrinks. All right, so let's take that to lettering. So the question we originally had was, how do I make lettering bolder? All right, so if I take, let's use typewriter, because that's a, yeah, the typewriter font's pretty narrow. And bold. Okay, so I've got this narrow font, and my narrow columns are gonna be a little bit narrower, narrower, thinner. There, I like that better. It's gonna be a little bit thinner when it sews. So how do we compensate for that? All right, so if I go into the properties, say pull compensation, notice my text got a little bolder. So I'm gonna be ridiculous here. Don't use 10, please don't. But you can see it's making it bolder. Why do I say don't do that? At some point, it start. it's too much. Make your text bigger and then add one to three points. Um, three is plenty that's like six points total um so one i put one point of offset on everything i do period just to allow for the fact that embroidery is going to narrow up a little bit okay so yeah to make it bolder your pull offset you can go into the properties by right clicking go to properties you can double click on it and go to properties you can do it straight up right here like i said don't do that but one to three points is usually plenty. Good morning, Lorena and Scott. Thank y'all for joining us. All right, looks like we've got close to 40 people online. Hi. All right, so let's see, what else do we have? 
Can you cover how to edge stitch a baby bib? Is there a way to do a scallop? All right, so yes, I actually turned that into a, a goofy little project to show you guys how to do. So let me come back to that um, in just a second. This guy right here, um, I don't know how to do that. Um, short of either drawing it by hand or doing a series of different fills. I'm gonna play around this week and I get distracted with the scallop thing and spent way too much time coming up with a project to show you guys <laughs> this morning. So um, anyway, it's this one. I don't know off the top of my head. I know we don't have any radial type fill like that. So um, I'll have to get back to you if I think of something, but right now I don't know that that's a feature we have. Um, oh, circular array. Like I said, I'm gonna come back to the scallop because we've got that multiple times. So uh, how do you create a circular array? This one's fun. All right, so I'm gonna go file, open, oh, go back, cancel. It was already there. I'm gonna go open up this, not my scallop. Like I said, I spent way too much time playing with that today. All right, so I'm just opening this. I'm gonna redraw it. All right, so right here we have, I basically drew a line and then I rotated around at 30 degree increments. Okay, so that would be evenly spaced. So the, fl the question was like, I wanna take that um, fleur de lis from the standard design. So how do I get to that? I turn on my common shapes. I go to custom designs, custom designs, and we got this fleur de lis. I'll show you how to do this a few different ways, see what's easiest for you. So I'm left click and drag it onto the screen, and I'm gonna pick two inches up. These are half inch marks of how I have my grid set. So I'm gonna set that where the bottom of the fleur de lis is roughly right at my two inch mark. Yeah, there we go. All right, so then I'm gonna copy and paste that, left click, and you'll see there's that rotation guy right there. So if I take that and move it down here to my origin points, now when I rotate it, it's rotating it around the origin. So I'm gonna rotate it to my 30 degree mark, copy, paste, left click. Right here, I'm gonna grab that rotation guy again and move it down here. Rotate this guy around there. Copy, paste, left click, drag my rotation point to the center, and I'm gonna rotate that there. And now we're gonna do a bunch of copying and pasting. All right, so if I select those top three, yeah, copy, paste. Right here I have mirror, left click and drag, and I'm gonna drag that down until this middle one is right at the two inch mark. So, there's half inch, one inch, inch and a half, two inch, cool. So now I'm gonna copy these guys, copy, paste, mirror, and again, move it over till a little bit further, there we go. That guy is right on the two inch mark, okay? So that's one way to do it. So what if we, Rio, that's really annoying. My dog is chewing on something, I'm sorry. The noise was gonna drive me crazy. Okay, let's do this again. Let's drag one up here. I'm gonna drag that guy here. And let's copy paste and just rotate it 90 degrees and put this guy over on the 90 degree mark. All right, this one's not really lined up. So we can do this a bunch of ways. I'm gonna Copy these guys, copy, paste, mirror, mirror, and drag it around until we're roughly lined up. Cool. So now if I take all these guys, copy, paste, then I can rotate from down here and say 45. Okay. So you can do it a whole bunch of different ways. You just gotta, you know, be creative about how you wanna rotate them. All right, so let's see. We have Margaret asks on Facebook, is there a shadow effect that can be added like the borders? 
on text like so I can take that I can go object shadow okay and I can add a shadow to that um, I'll be honest I don't think I've ever tried that with anything other than text so why not we let's try it shadow hey look it does it on other stuff too that's fun so yeah you can add shadows so you can do it both ways. You can do on the text, object, shadow, or on different shapes. Hey, that was cool. I gotta remember that. All right, so yeah, when, how I did that, I typed my text, shadow, selected it, object, shadow, okay. Got a shadow. Good morning, Georgia, on YouTube. Thanks for joining. Okay. Let's see, what else do we have? What other questions? Uh, we did the circular array. I'm going to come back to my scallop. These are easy, so let's talk about those. Is there a limit for the number of stitch files you can load into the OS queue? Not that I'm aware of. So um, in the master queue, I think you can put as many as you want. The, how can we load a stitch file to the OS and have it show the correct colors that were digitized? All right, I'm not actually running my equipment, so I hooked up so we could actually look at it directly. So let's load a file. I'm gonna load the one day. And you'll notice it comes up with crazy colors. That's because of my settings on my machine. So over here, I have my color tree colored so that this is just what I like to do. I like to double check that what I have colored actually shows up how I want it to show. So I like to double check it. So I have these settings on purpose. So I can, of course, step forward through it. And let's say I want red pears, uh, teal leaves, an orange bird, and black outlines. So when I hit apply, cool, it shows me that color but if you don't want it to do that the only reason that works is because my color tree is colored so if you want to if your color tree is not and it's all gray you would have to set the colors by right clicking on it and going and choosing you know whatever thread you have at that location so let's say i put yellow on needle 15 and let's say bark that's 1728 on needle one i would have to make sure it's colored appropriately for that all right and then the other thing you in order for it to show up how you have it colored is under tools settings settings right here um, use colors from design that box has to be unchecked for this to work how i have it set up here so it shows you what it's colored now if you tell it to use colors from design if that box is checked it's going to show up how it was you know that file is currently colored is how it's going to show up on your screen Okay, regardless of what you have here and what colors are. Now, like I said, I don't like it because I do not have it colored like this. I do not have these threads on my machine. Um, I have it colored, you know, red, teal, five, orange, and black. All right, is how I have it currently colored, yet that's not what's showing up. So tools, settings, settings use colors from design uncheck that box and now it will show up with however my color tree is colored all right so it's a personal preference some folks like it to show up exactly as it was digitized um, so you would want to use colors from design i prefer it this way okay what other questions do we have we talked about pull comp all right true type fonts true type fonts are computer-based fonts they're keyboard fonts that work in um, all kinds of different softwares right so what you would want to do is close design shop find whatever true type font you want to use install it on your computer um, once it's installed on the computer let's see do i have any not installed well here let's click on this my designs things i've bought i put a bunch of true types up here earlier a bit of grief. I buy all kinds of stuff. Sorry. Font. Honey. Honey. Is that one up here? Of course not. It was on the other computer. All right. Let's see. OTF. 
you can use OTF or TTF. All right, so you would double click on it, click on install. This is just through Windows. Um, install, it would install that font. Once it's installed, you would close and reopen Design Shop. That one's already on this computer. American Horror Story, Sam. There we go. Okay, and it will auto digitize it for you. Okay, so yeah, true type fonts are you can use TTFs or OTFs in Design Shop 11. In Design Shop 10, you would only be able to use true type fonts, so the extension TTF. So in 11, you can use OTFs as well. But um, yeah, you can use whichever ones you want. Uh, let's see, I know Google has free fonts. I think Nate mentioned that in yesterday's Q&A that we had with the group. All right, so that's true type fonts. We did that, okay, so, oh. Can someone please tell me why there are rulers, why there are rulers in this software? Just a simple ruler for the top and bottom. Tell me why, I don't know. I, this is my ruler. My grid is my ruler. So if you want to change the grid, you can right click on the um, this icon here. Words were leaving me. So right there is the, if I right click, then I can change my grid to whatever spacing I want. So if you want one inch spacing, different subdivisions, all of that. So I can see it really easily. I've got my center line, my darker lines here are half inch spacing, and then it's 10 in between. Um, why there are no rule? I think you're asking why there aren't rulers along the top or the bottom. I don't know. I'd have to take, ask engineering. Um, I'm guessing it's because there's a grid here and the grid is a visual cue of the rulers as it is. You always, you also have this guy here. So if you click on that, you can left click and drag and it will measure for you and show you on the screen. Yeah, it, it's just, that's not a, um, so there, you're saying why they're not rulers at the top or the side like Photoshop. Um, I don't know why that's not there. So yeah, Scott, she's asking, why there's not a ruler up here and on the side like you would see in Photoshop or Illustrator and some those sorts of programs. Um, I don't know, I'd have to ask engineering. I just know it's not there. <laughs> you can use this guy here or you can look at the grid and set the grid to whatever you want. Okay, so I think I answered, let me quick scroll on these. Yep, okay. So we. I covered all these questions, so let's go look at that scallop example. So the question we had was, you know, how do you cover the edge of a bib to make it, um, to do like a scalloped edge? And that was also asked a second time, can, can I put a scalloped edge or a fancy edge design on a plain handkerchief? Oh, Scott tells me there's a way. Let's go try it. View, grid ruler. Hey, check it out. There you go. So um, on YouTube, where you're asking how to get those grids, so view, grid ruler, view, grid ruler. I'm going to leave it on for now. That's cool. Thank you, Scott. I guess I should have known that, but I never use it. I'm going to use it now and see how that works. All right, so let's go look at my scallop. So file open my scallop. This is what I'm going to show us how to create, but let's start from scratch. All right, so let's say I want to take a plain old handkerchief, plain old rectangle, and on this corner, rather than having a corner, I want to put a scalloped edge on it, and I want to add some decorations along it. So what? Do, how do we do this? All right, so First thing I'm going to do is I drew some art, right? So I did a whole lot of silly iterations to come up with what do I want that scallop to look like. And when I mean silly, 
just to give you an example, I started off with, does this show up on my screen? Who knows? Um, I even started off drawing things on a paper and taking pictures of it and, you know, trying to find something of what I wanted a scallop to look like. All right, so then I turned it into vectors and now I have this vector art on the screen. So let's digitize how we're going to do this. So this is going to be my um, handkerchief or my border. I need the handkerchief placement to be about 20 points larger than that because I'm going to use a 40 point border. So what we're going to start with is you're going to hoop some stabilizer. Uh, you can use like a wash, a sticky wash and cut sort of thing. So where it's like a violin with a sticky edge on it, or you can use a water soluble stabilizer and use some spray adhesive, anything like that. You're going to hoop that. So what we're thinking about is how do we want to create this, you know, cut this edge off. So I'm going to start off by drawing me a placement stitch. All right. So I'm going to take this here, which is larger than my scallop. I'm going to hold the shift key down and draw and shift and click on the walk normal. And that's going to give me a placement stitch. Okay. So if I turn off the grid, just so we can see it a little better, now I have a rectangle. What, if, what is that for? I'm just going to sew that onto my stabilizer so I can then take my fabric and stick it down. Now that you can see what I'm doing. So I can take my handkerchief, line it up with the edge of that. So this is my handkerchief. Line up my corner with the that line on the stabilizer. All right, so that's the only thing that stitch is for. Now that's just a placement stitch. I don't really need that to be 20 points. I can make that a little bit larger just to save on stitch count. All right, so now I've got a rectangle that my handkerchief fabric is gonna be laid down to, okay. So now we need to tack that hanky down so it's just not moving all over the place. So remember you stick it to your stabilizer um, using like a spray adhesive, line it up with this edge. That's cool. So now I want to take my shape here and tack down and give me some placement lines, right? So if I hold this guy, this is just my artwork. It gives me my original outline scallop. And in the end, that's the only thing I want. So by having this larger, it's securing it closer to these stitches here, okay? All right, so I'm gonna take this guy, again, hold my shift key down, click on it, and then I'm going to split element at selected points on these corners. Okay, what did I do that for? All right, so let's turn all this off and look at what we got. Go away, Rio. Delete that point and delete that point. That's because this line right here is a basting stitch that is going to, um, it's just there to hold the fabric down. So I can put that closer to 40 points because I am gonna have to cut that out in the end, you know, pick the stitches out. And if I have super tight stitches, it's, yes, you can do it, but it's annoying. Um, if they're longer, they're easier to pick out. You can just cut the bobbin stitch and then the top stitch pops right out. Okay, and then this guy, I'm gonna be trimming around like an applique, so I want that to be a bean stitch. All right, so now I've got my handkerchief sewed down like that. All right, so I've got a piece of fabric with a bean stitch up here and a basting stitch here. I'm gonna go grab my scissors and cut close to this line right here. All right, so what you're left with at that point is something that looks closer to this. All right, again, it's this is like doing an applique just on top of the hoop, right? So now that I have my bean stitch holding this down, now it's just a matter of how do you want the rest of this to look? Well, I can take my, what I, this fill, and let's say I wanna put a decorative stitch on there. All right, so I can operation, change element type, change it to a complex fill and add, and then change the fill to a decorative. And why don't we change it to a honeycomb? All right, so now I have a decorative honeycomb stitch on there. So that's fun. Um, now we need to go through and add our satin stitches around the edge. So again, you can take your shape that you want it to be, change element from one type to another, 
or let's see, operations, change element type. Let's say single line center, add, and it'll add a single line, but I want the outer one to be wider. So I'm gonna split it here and I'm gonna split it down here, right there, split element. So now I can take this guy here, make it closer to 40 points to get me a nice border on there. And maybe the inner one, let's make that 30. So now it's just a matter of playing cleanup. All right, so if I turn off all my vectors, you can see what I have so far. So I've got my scallop all sewn down. I wanna clean up these edges. I can take that guy, move it up. I'm gonna move it over a little bit to line up a little better. Yeah, there we go. That's cute. All right, and same thing on this corner. I wanna clean that fella up. Let's delete that point. There we go. Cool. Gotta get, I added an extra point by accident is not what I wanted to do. There we go. Yeah. All right. So I've got this one sewing second. There you go. So at this point, you can add any other decorative stitches you want. You can see I was playing. I'll turn off this and turn on my original design. So I have my, that I created this morning. I did my box to place the fabric down. This as my applique. I did a little tacking on this edge and then I did my decorative, my satin stitch around here and then I decided to draw some bees because why not? <laughs> so I drew some bees and there we go. So now I would, in the end, this is what I would have. So yes, you can it, you just got to think about what art you want for your scallop on your hanky, your things like that. So there was a question, do we have a snap to grid? Uh, snap to grid mode. There isn't a snap to point. There's a snap to grid. If you want to close a shape, you can hold shift enter and it will close it. And that will snap it directly to the point. Okay. So that is... A cute little scallop and I sent it to Melko I'm not sure they want it but when I was coming up with this artwork over here um, I recorded myself making that and all the stupid um, shenanigans I went through to create it so I don't know if that's something that will eventually be posted but I recorded it just to have it okay um, there was a question asked uh, where did it go um, where do you find a list of all the keyboard shortcuts? Um, I will get you a link to the accelerator. So if you go to the service um, site, the uh, melco-service.com and search for accelerator shortcuts or something like that, um, it'll pop up and it will show you how you can create your own. You can use um, Scott's favorites and it has a list of shortcuts for you. You can always create your own by going, um, there's the link just popped in so tools accelerator editor and that's where you can create your own look for the command you want and type the assign a short key to it um, another trick you have is notice on these drop downs um, some of them have keys next to them those are the sh the hot keys on the keyboard for those particular commands so that's another way you can see some that are already programmed for you Okay, let's see what other questions do we have. Um, okay, I think those were all the questions. I don't see any on YouTube nor on Facebook. So I'll kind of goof around here for a few more minutes in case... There's some questions that come in late. There is going to be um, another live in about half an hour, I believe, for um, where 
John LaDrew is going to be showing you um, mixed media and embroidery. Oh, there's a question. Do you have any tips or tricks on how to stave on stabilizer? Um, no. Well, let me take that back. Uh, <laughs> so stabilizer, I buy it by the massive roll and I hate to skimp on stabilizer because uh, this is just my personal my personal preferences. I hate st skimping on it because there's nothing worse than sewing something out and then going, oh, I should have used more stabilizer, another layer of it. Um, the one thing I do keep is when I am done with a project, I'll cut it out and that leftover stabilizer, I'll cut into shapes that you can, you know, little rectangles that I can use to float under hoops for when I need additional stabilizer. So I don't have to go cut a whole new piece. I've got these kind of scraps into, you know, little piles that when I need extra stabilizer to just um, add a little bit extra for different areas, I can slide it under the hoop and keep going. So that's something I do. Do I also, when I'm using massive, the big 11 by 17 hoops or the big uh, 16 by 16 square, um, I will tend to keep the extra stabilizer there to use in the smaller hoops. So I have seen people do silly, uh, do things like sewing stabilizer together and whatnot. I personally don't recommend that, nor do I do it. I've seen people do it. They like it. Cool, if that works for you. Um, that's great. Uh, I don't do it personally just because I really dislike having to make stuff because I um, did, you know, I didn't do what I should have done with the stabilizer. So uh, what I can suggest, though, is to buy in bulk, <laughs> you know, buy a big old roll. They, uh, you can buy a like the 3.1 ounce stabilizer um, comes in these 20 inch rolls you know, 25, 50, or 100 yards, and you can um, use that for pretty much whatever you want, cut it down into shapes, now, I, and to whatever size you want, so I do buy it, it ends up being cheaper when you do that, when you buy the 100 yards or something like that, rather than the, tw you know, the 10 or 15 yards that you can find commercial, or in retail stores, so buying in bulk does help. All right, any other questions? I don't see any on Facebook. I don't see any on YouTube. Okay, so um, I hope everybody has a fantastic weekend. Like I said, there is another live in about half an hour doing mixed media and things like that, which that'll be a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, someone says their son cuts down stabilizer on a saw. Uh, actually, I have done that. So I have I buy buckram, which is the same stabilizer you use on the, um, that's used on the back of hats. Um, so I actually take that onto a bandsaw and cut it into shape, cut it down because it comes in 60 inch rolls. And 60 inch rolls of buckram at 100 yards is heavy and bulky. So I actually cut it into smaller 100, 100 inch, um, 100 yard rolls that are easier to manage. So yeah, that's a great tip. All right, everyone, have a fantastic weekend. Tomorrow I'm doing soccer all day. Hopefully not in the rain. <laughs> so uh, sports season for kids, always fun. You guys have a fantastic weekend. I will be back next week. Um, be sure to check out uh, John's session in a little bit, mixed media and embroidery and all that fun stuff and how powerful it can be. So that'll be cool. And otherwise, I'll be back in about a week to see what else we can cover. All right. Thanks for joining. Bye, y'all. <laughs>